Health Education Project Specialist here at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center. I help coordinate all the programming here. Too. And um, so before we begin, please be aware that Mass Channel will be live streaming and recording this presentation for Mass Channel social media. Mass Channel staff are trained in patient safety and privacy. The staff will not interfere with the presentation in any way. If you are not comfortable asking a question out loud, you're welcome to place your question on the card, just raise your hand and I can read the question on your behalf. Before we begin, you are given a survey. Does anyone, everyone have a packet? Perfect. If you don't mind helping us fill out that survey at the end of the program, it just takes a couple of minutes. Your valuable feedback will help us improve the future programming. So today we have Dr. Mike Pistoner. He is the Director of Food Allergy Advocacy, Education Prevention for the Mass General Hospice for Children Food Allergy Center. And he is here to give a talk on food allergy management. This program is a collaboration between the Blum Center and Food Allergy Advocacy and Education Program. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Pistoner. All right. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us today. And thank you in the world of Facebook. Um, it's nice to have you guys here as well. And uh, um, so what we'll do is go through the slides um, for the most part here, and if we have questions within the room, we'll hold them until we're done with the main part of the talk, and then we'll have a little bit of food allergy question thunderdome afterwards. All right. So Superman is the epitome of health, the epitome of strength. Like kids, he's faster than a speeding bullet, and he seemingly can't be stopped. Like teenagers, he's a snappy dresser and he thinks he's invincible. And like people with food allergies, something that is seemingly harmless to others can hurt him very quickly. So this is my Superman, this is Scott, and he's now 15, and when he was three and a half, we gave him a chocolate bar with walnut in it, and we happened to be in our local Whole Foods. He thought it was absolutely delicious, and then he started noticing that he couldn't get the taste down. So he turned to my wife and I and started getting a little bit agitated and said, I can't get the taste out. And that's when I turned to my wife and I said, Pam, I think he's having an allergic reaction. And at that time, I was a second year fellow at Children's Hospital Boston. And she looked at me and she told me to shut up because I was such an allergist. <laughs> Within about two to three minutes, he got increasingly agitated. Then he started vomiting, and the people in the fish department of Whole Foods really didn't like that. 20 minutes in, he started sneezing. He started getting itchy in his ears. Then he started <coughs> throat clearing. Then about 30 minutes in, he had hives. That's when my wife looked at me and said, I think he's having an allergic reaction. So what was that? That was anaphylaxis. That was a severe, life-threatening allergic reaction. And for me, that was my first time in the shoes of parent of a child with food allergies. And so firsthand, I got to see how complicated things can be and the importance of the role that parents have for kids with food allergies. And so parents need to be coordinators, work with doctors, work with schools, work with the surrounding community uh, to be able to make sure that the kid is um, in the right hands. They need to be advocates and ensure that health and self-esteem are taken care of at all times and in all circumstances. They need to be role models. They, we need to be doing the things that we ultimately want our kids to do as they get older, and we also need to be doing the things that we want our surrounding community to be doing um, when they observe us. We also are educators, and this is really challenging. We need to know the language to be able to train others and to be able to discuss food allergies the prevention strategies and the emergency preparedness for our children and for the surrounding community. So the goals of this talk are to help you address the uncertainty of food allergy and replace it with facts and empowerment. I also am hoping that whoever you are out there, with what you learn today, you'll be able to engage in partnerships and collaborations that are going to be able to help support kids with food allergies. Now, for the newly diagnosed and for folks who are new at this, then um, I'm going to be going at a pace that is likely going to be good, but if this goes a little too fast, then since it's being taped on live streaming, you can always go back. And there's also going to be supporting resources 
Um, now, for those who've been doing this for a while, and for those who are pros at this, the, the hope is, is that the language that I use here is going to be something that you can then use to train others. And so right now, I know that we have a mixed audience, and just so I get a sense, um, no one needs to raise their hand if you don't want to, but so I know who I'm talking to here, and everybody at home, you guys can raise your hands too. Um, but anybody here who um, is a parent of a kid with food allergy? All right, and anybody who is a healthcare provider? And any uh, educators? And anybody, a um, grandparent or relative of a child with food allergy? All right. And so whoever you are and whatever your role, think about what I'm about to go through with you for ways that you can support the kids in your life who have food allergy. So it's good to start with the basics, the nuts and bolts. What is a food allergy? The type that we're going to be talking about here is an IgE-mediated food allergy. These are the ones that can cause a fast, strong, severe allergic reaction like I talked about with my boy. A food allergy is an abnormal immune response to food protein. And in this case, if someone has a peanut allergy, when they eat peanut, then the peanut protein gets absorbed and it can, it can come in contact within our body with allergy cells, mast cells and basophils, that have IgE to peanut. So IgE is immunoglobulin E, and um, this is uh, a protein in our body that is usually going to be around if we're going to potentially have a strong reaction. And so if somebody is allergic to peanut eats it, then it can bind to the IgE, causing the allergy cells to release what's inside them. Now this is an incredible simplification of something pretty complicated, but this is a concept that is helpful to understand. The majority of allergens um, uh, can fall under what right now is the major eight within the United States, and the most common of these, milk, egg, wheat, soy, peanut, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish, but it's important to know that people can be allergic to practically anything. And if somebody has an IgE-mediated allergy, then it needs to be taken just as seriously as one of these major eight allergens. Now, symptoms of an allergic reaction and anaphylaxis can vary. And so this is the point that at this point I want you guys to grab onto, not necessarily to memorize, but each individual can have different signs and symptoms to another individual. And the same person can even have a different reaction a different time. And so understanding that there's going to be potential patterns that are going to make people then say, you know what, I think this might be an allergic reaction, is the point. So people can have symptoms of the skin, hives, swelling, itching, warmth, redness. Keep in mind that while 80 to 90 percent of people even experiencing anaphylaxis will have skin findings, 10 to 20 percent don't. So it's going to be then important to understand the patterns of the other signs and symptoms. For the respiratory tract, coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, trouble swallowing, hoarse voice, nasal congestion, sneezing, itchy eyes like my son experienced, these are things that you want to be aware of and for other grown-ups to be aware of when they're caring for your kid. Um, gastrointestinal symptoms, nausea, stomach pain, cramping, vomiting, diarrhea, cardiovascular symptoms, um, people can be dizzy. Young kids who can't express themselves might be wobbly, they might be lethargic, having a hard time holding up their head, paleness, blueness, um, uh, ultimately fainting, loss of consciousness. People can get really scared and grown-ups can describe it as a sense of pending doom. A little kid might describe it as just being scared and of the younger ones who can't really use words, inconsolable and unable to be calmed. And uh, um, women can also experience uterine cramping. The majority of IgE-mediated allergic reactions occur within minutes to a few hours after exposure to the food trigger. As I mentioned, anaphylaxis is a severe life-threatening allergic reaction. Some people have no skin findings, and it can start with mild symptoms and progress. Epinephrine, which is the medication version of adrenaline, is an excellent medicine that works quick. 
It's first treatment, first line treatment for anaphylaxis. It's safe and it works quickly. <coughs> now, as we've experienced, there is very real emotional and social impact of food allergy on kids. And kids can have issues with participation in activities. Um, some children might be afraid of having an allergic reaction or afraid of dying. Some children are afraid of being different from their peers and being left out. Um, studies have shown that 35% of kids over age five have been bullied, teased, or harassed because of their food allergy. And so being able to support the kids from an emotional and social perspective is really important. Now, it's challenging to find that perfect mix between worried thoughts and anxiousness and risk taking and danger. And so finding this sweet spot, this, um, this, this perfect balance is really the goal. And that is the hope of this talk, um, which is that once you get some of the rules down for how you manage your food allergy, then it can help you find that balance to maintain quality of life while at the same time maintaining safety. And so to take a seemingly complicated thing and make it simple, we can break it down into two pillars, the pillars of prevention and emergency preparedness. These need to be applied at all times and in all settings. So now you want to take these pillars of preventing an allergic reaction and being prepared for an allergic emergency wherever you are, home, school, restaurants, parties, playdates, secondary caregivers, whoever the kid is with and wherever they are, then these pillars need to be implemented. We'll start with the pillar of prevention. You need to act to prevent accidental exposures. Avoid, communicate, and teach. We'll start with avoid. In order to avoid, you need to know how you might come in contact with food. The most important is through the mouth. This is where the most severe and most significant reactions are gonna occur. Other routes of exposure could be breathing it in, touching it through the skin and in the nose and in the eye. Now, in order to prevent oral ingestion, we'll need to know that small amounts can cause an allergic reaction. In most cases, strict avoidance is what's recommended. Now, this is where the families are gonna to need to have excellent communication with their healthcare providers and their allergists to find out um, for which foods, how strictly are they avoiding. Now, the majority of people with an allergy are gonna to need to strictly avoid with label reading. There's gonna be some children, examples are kids who can ingest baked in egg or baked in milk. Some of those kids with an allergist guidance um, will have slightly different label reading strategies than somebody who had to avoid all dairy products and read labels entirely to avoid milk. So that'll be between you and your healthcare providers. And for anybody out there in Facebook land or here also, um, before you change any of your medical management, then please consult with your healthcare provider and or your allergist, um, I don't count. So label reading is absolutely essential. Things to know are that manufacturers can change labels without letting us know. So looking at the label and reading it thoroughly, each time an item is, um, is, is gonna be opened um, or given to the child is gonna be important. And so um, this would be if a particular cracker company decided to use peanut flour, they don't necessarily need to let you know, but they do need to put it on the label. So this way, if everyone just gets used to reading the label before that food is given to the child, then that would pick up those rare um, things, but that way it's a good way to ensure that the food that the child is eating is safe for them. Now, all caregivers who are gonna be responsible for serving or preparing food to that kid should be trained on how to read a label. And it's not all that easy just to walk into a situation without education. And I'll show you some of the uh, details that we're gonna need to communicate to anybody reading labels. So first off, we are lucky to have the Food Allergy Labeling Consumer Protection Act. 
This happens to apply to the eight most common allergens, the major eight. This law asks for clear labeling for milk, egg, peanut, tree nut, wheat, soy, fish, and crustacean shellfish. This is 90% of what people are allergic to. And if a company is going to include these in any way, shape, or form, then it has to be plainly put on the label in plain English. And if they're going to want to use slided in flavorings, colorings, or additives, they do need to disclose. So that makes it easy to know that it's in there. Now, foods that don't need this clear labeling are meats, poultry, certain egg products, and alcoholic beverages, because these are not regulated by the FDA. So for example, a beer doesn't have to plainly say that weed is in it, because that is not regulated by FDA. So that's something to think about. Now, other foods that aren't going to be clearly labeled like this are non-major eight foods, things like sesame, things like molluscan shellfish, like oysters, clams, mussels, scallops, um, some of the gluten-containing grains with exception of wheat. So while wheat needs to be in the label under Falcpa, barley and rye don't. So these things can be hidden in wastebasket terms that are not in plain language. So you can put barley in something called malt, dextrins, flavors, or other things. Um, you could put sesame in things that say spices. And so this is going to be important for the parents and caregivers taking care of kids with these non-major aid allergens. So take home point is that if you have an allergy to something not in the major eight, then it can be hidden in flavorings, colorings, and additives, and learn what those might be for the food in particular that your child is allergic to. So now, if we're following FALCPA for one of the major eight allergens, there can be two ways that a company can choose to put a label. Now, an optional way, and I'll start with this one, is for them to opt to put a contained statement. If they put this contained statement, then if a major eight is somewhere in this item, then they're supposed to put it after the contained statement. So in this item, wheat, milk, and soy, they do the work for us. They make it pretty easy. So if your kid is allergic to any of these, then you don't give them this, and you don't have to take the time to read the label. But I would implore, get used to always reading the paragraph to make sure that you can have it. So if a child is allergic to peanut, first look, this looks like it might be good and it's worth looking further. Then you go back and you read this label and then you make sure that peanut is not in there. Now the other way that a company can disclose is simply by putting it in plain language in the body of the paragraph. Notice, peanut is the second ingredient. It's not emolded, it's not sticking out, there's nothing fancy about it, you just have to read it. So training people to get used to just reading for the child's allergen is going to be important. Now those pesky cautionary statements may contain traces of produced in a facility, manufactured on equipment. Um, that is very common, and a lot of people have questions about what do you do with it. Now this is going to be something that is going to be a conversation between an allergist, a healthcare provider, and a family. It's going to be a little dependent on the food, it's going to be a lot dependent on the allergist, and at this time there are some different approaches, and as long as this is an approach that the allergist in collaboration with the family has come up with, then this is something that is going to work for that situation. Now, studies have shown that when you have one of these cautionary statements, then you can have detectable allergen for that food. One particular study showed that 7% of peanut products that had a cautionary statement had detectable peanut. Now, in many of those cases, it wasn't high enough to actually cause an allergic reaction, but in some it was. And so, ultimately, if someone were to want to take the lowest risk, then excluding things with a cautionary statement for that food makes a lot of sense. Hidden ingredients. Now, it's not obvious what's in a food when you look. 
Now, a hidden ingredient is oftentimes known by the person putting the food together and cooking the food, but you couldn't tell just by looking at it. And the take home point of all of this is going to be, you got to read the label. The only way to know if something is in something else is if you look at the label for it. So, in the case of milk, dairy, it's commonly in breads. People can butter steaks in restaurants. It can be found in canned tuna. Cheese alternatives, and the doozy that captures a lot of people who are untrained is even non-dairy creamers. It's just counterintuitive. But in order to pick up and, and not miss one of these potential mistakes, label reading is going to be the answer. And so even an infrequent caregiver is going to need to be trained because this stuff is not obvious. Peanuts and tree nuts can commonly be in many dessert items in Asian food, cross contact in seeds and packaged popcorn and other things like that. You can find it in ice cream. People can use it to keep egg rolls together. It can be in sauces in multiple foods. The take home point again is read a label because this is the only way you can tell if it's in there. Egg, commonly in baked goods, egg alternatives, froth on some drinks, pastas, ice cream, and when you go to your uh, wholesale store and you have that pretzel sitting there for 40 years and it's shiny, that shine can be egg wash and people wouldn't know it unless you actually read a label. Soy. It can commonly be found in tons of things. Again, label reading is the take home point here. Wheat, meat substitutes, ice cream, soy sauce, salad dressing, processed meats. You wouldn't know it unless you looked at the label. Fish and shellfish also can hide in things. Oftentimes, Asian food can have fish and shellfish, barbecue sauce, and Worcestershire sauce. I still can't say it. <laughs> and non edible items also can have some food. So just being aware of this is going to be important, uh, especially in the preschool setting and when the kids are little and still exploring their environment with their hands and their mouths, and we'll talk a bit about that. So bigger pink can have milk or egg, white. Shaving cream can have milk. Paste can have wheat. Pet food has anything that's in the pet food. Play-Doh has wheat in it. Um, old school bean bag furniture used to have nuts. Bird seed, nuts and seeds, and food-related activities have whatever food to the teachers choose to use. Now, inhalation is a fear root of exposure, but luckily, um, very preventable, and we have some really reassuring information about it. So, there was one study where they held styrofoam cups with peanut butter in it, uh, about a foot from uh, kids who have had severe reactions to peanut in the past. They masked it with tuna fish, so that was a very smelly, um, smelly time for them and uh, probably not the best of fun, but none of them had a systemic reaction. None of them had a reaction. Now, that smell that we smell when I'm holding a Snickers bar and you can smell my peanut, um, that's caused by something called a volatile organic compound, and in the case of peanut, a pyrazine. Now, noticed it before I said allergic reactions are most commonly caused by proteins. Now, if you aerosolize protein, if you do something to bring the protein up, like active cooking, or you grind something and blow the dust at someone, that's going to be an exposure that can cause a reaction. And so the nice thing is that most of these are things that we can avoid. And so active cooking can aerosolize foods. Now in the case of fish and shellfish, this is more commonly seen. This is much less commonly seen with somebody with a peanut allergy or tree nuts. Um, and so sometimes also boiling milk or something that's going to bring up um, these particles and vapors up into the air, that's going to be an exposure that we're going to want to avoid. Skin. Skin does a really good job keeping allergen out. So there have been some studies where they took peanut and they put it, peanut butter, and they put it on the skin, intact skin, um, of people who have had strong reactions in the past. Nobody had systemic, nobody had full body allergic reactions, but about 30 to 40% of people would be expected to have local rash hives. Um, and that is really reassuring. That healthy skin keeps it from turning into a full out allergic reaction. 
But all bets are off if you turn it into an oral exposure and eat it. So kids between the age of 12 months and two years put their hands or an object in their mouth 80 times an hour. Kids between two years and five years, 40 times an hour. And then there was this one study done of grown-ups in a library, and they found that they were taking their fingers and putting them in their eyes, mouth, or nose 15 times an hour. So a skin exposure can very quickly turn into an oral or mucosal exposure that then can cause more significant symptoms. Now, cross-contact is the presence of unintended food allergen. This is when we aren't meaning for this food to be in that other food, um, and now someone is unknowingly eating it. Common causes can be items that are difficult to clean in between the next food prep. For example, I go to the deli and I order roast beef, and it's cut on the slicer where the provolone cheese was just cut, and I have a dairy allergy. Food splatters from here into the other food that happened to be sitting next to it on the range. I have a shrimp allergy, and I'm getting the french fries that were just sitting in the oil where the shrimp poppers were made in the morning. Now my french fries have shrimp protein on them, even though it's wildly hot. It's not enough to change the shape. Buffets. You can have any cross contact because it's really hard to keep those spoons and, and, and other like forks and things from going from one tray to the next. Oven mitts and aprons are also common causes as we can have people handling items, wiping the food off on their oven mitt or on their apron and then going back and handling others. Same with garnishings. If somebody's gonna pick up the sea salt and keep taking their fingers and going back and forth, these are gonna be ways that someone can have cross contact. Now other ways are gonna be, envision someone takes a butter knife that has peanut butter on it, and without cleaning it and wiping it free of peanut, just chucks it in the sanitizing dip bucket along with all the other items in there too. Now you're not gonna have virus, you're not gonna have bacteria, but um, then when they come out, if they still have chunks on them, if the others now have chunks on them, then that could be a potential source. So someone's gonna want to clean and sanitize, not just sanitize. And high chairs and car seats, these will be things for the parents of kids who are on the young side, who remember that 80 times an hour of things going in the mouth, Cleaning these surfaces prior to putting your baby in it is a good idea. Um, Tabletops, hands, utensils, cups, water bottles, cutting boards and prep surfaces will be something to think about. And now, if I use a sponge to clean my peanut butter plate and then I use it on my kid's sippy cup, I could have some peanut protein that I then add to their sippy cup. And so thinking about if there is a child in the house who has an allergy, then using cleaning products or using a disposable rag or something that isn't used for peanut would make sense. Now saliva can also have allergen. And so there was a study where they were looking at people who were eating peanut products and different things you can do to try to decrease um, the amount of peanut in their saliva. And so they did testing to see the detectable peanut. And they had people brush their teeth, and that didn't bring it to undetectable. They had people do mouthwash, and that didn't bring it to undetectable. The only thing that brought the level of saliva to undetectable for peanut was several hours later eating a peanut-free meal and then doing the test. And again, sharing of water bottles and things. This can pass saliva, lipstick, other things like that. Um, dogs eating the food that a child's allergic to and then smooching the kid, or the kid eating the dog food is another way that you can have allergens. So keeping in mind, especially with the younger ones and families with pets, think about it. And when you visit someone's house, also think about it. And uh, you know, try to keep your kids from eating pet food. So, cleaning. What's really cool is that cleaning to prevent cross-contact is simple. And so, soap and water and commercial hand wipes 
work for your hands. What doesn't is Purell or other gels that just desiccate, right? So what I was saying before is that high heat and, and that drying alcohol isn't gonna necessarily break down the shape of the allergen enough to make it a non-issue. So what you're gonna need to do is mechanically clean and wipe it away, and that's what soap and water commercial hand wipes are great at. Cleaning surfaces is also very nicely, it's, it's, it's pretty easy. Soap and water, commercial cleaners, commercial wipes work. You don't need bleach, you don't need a blowtorch. Simple things are gonna take care of it. Now, each group is gonna have different issues of cross contact, as I was already getting at. The young kids explore their environment with their hands and their mouths. The big kids explore each other with their hands and their mouths. And so understanding where you might have these sources of cross contact is gonna be important in helping guide um, those with food allergies. Now, we're acting to prevent accidental exposures and the C of ACT is to communicate. So we're gonna want anyone who's gonna be caring for the kid with food allergies is gonna to need to know that they're caring for a kid with food allergies. And so thoroughly communicating is gonna be really important. One of those things is gonna be the emergency care plan. And I'm gonna talk about that in depth um, in the second half of this. Now, um, teaching is also important and complicated because you need to kind of get the concepts that I just went through enough to be able to then walk somebody else through that those concepts of cross contact, those concepts of label reading. Now teaching, we're gonna need to teach our kids. We're gonna need to teach the grown-ups who are taking care of our kids. And perhaps even later, we're gonna need to teach our kids friends um, and or the teacher who's gonna teach our kids friends. So this way, once other people start assuming these roles, so the hope is that a school already has familiarity with this, and here in Massachusetts, we're really lucky because we have excellent school nurses and we have excellent guidelines where this really does put it in the responsibility of the schools for pan education. So this way, families, when they enter the school system, it's not the parents who are now training the school, but the school already has these concepts. And then, when they train these kids, then we have a whole boatload of food allergy aware people who can support the kids as they get older and older. And we're seeing this. A couple points when it comes to talking to kids and training kids about their own food allergy. The first point, the unknown can be scary. Kids oftentimes come up with a way scarier reality than it really is. Good examples are what's under the bed and what's in the dark. Um, once you turn on the lights, it's way less scary. Second point I'd like to make is that kids believe grown-ups. And excellent points here are Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy. Kids really believe that this gentleman can fly across the world in a single night bringing toys pulled by a team of flying reindeer. They also believe that the Tooth Fairy is no less magical. She doesn't need the reindeer and she doesn't get a break every night. They believe this. So they're gonna believe what they tell them. Third point is that with food allergies comes a lot of uncertainty. Some people, they're uncertain about what is risk and what is not. What happens if I smell it? What happens if I walk past it? What happens if it touches my skin? So these are ways that with what we're learning and talking through, we can help kids figure out what is risk and what is not and make some of this a little bit less uncertain and a lot less scary. At the same time, we have to be super careful about not sending scary messages to our children. So in the media, in social media, we see this all the time, and oftentimes this really isn't the case. Now to grown-ups, we may not be noticing that our kids are picking up on some of this, hearing some of these conversations in the background, which are way scarier than they need to be. And so we can make interventions, we can change the language, we can explain things to the kids based on the rules that we're learning and talking through right now. And so we can help kids appropriately take control of their situation. So now we're never gonna ask for little ones to do things that developmentally they're not ready to do, 
but being aware of what it is that the grown-ups are doing so it's less magical is going to be really helpful. And so having them participate in age-appropriate management skills can give them a sense of control. Um, you can practice certain scenarios. This is really going to come in handy when they're adolescents and teenagers and they start self-managing way more on their own. And talking this through before they're in the situation can be really helpful. And um, also, teaching assertiveness skills is going to be important. Um, when that really nice neighbor comes with a tray of cookies, and it is the social expectation that we are show gratitude, um, it's really hard for somebody sometimes to say no thank you. And so this is going to be something that practicing and talking through this and making them aware is going to be important. Now, one nice way to also think about this stuff is by safety rules. When we ask a kid to do something, so for example, when we get in a car, we just put on your safety belt. We don't necessarily think about all the scary things that can happen if you don't put on your safety belt. When you cross the street, you look both ways. When you get on wheels, you wear a helmet. When you go swimming, you make sure there's a lifeguard and you don't dive in the shallow end. These are the rules that we just learn, and they're just part of what we do. And then this is the way we can start talking about this and presenting this to kids with food allergies. Somebody reads the label. If you don't eat it, if you can't read it, don't eat it. Emergency medicine is somewhere close by. You get a grown up if there's any question or concern or worry. Wash your hands before you eat. Don't eat other people's food. These are basic rules that we can communicate in the different levels of, of, of where the kid's ready. And it's going to also be an individual thing. Some kids may want to take on more. Some kids may want to take on less. And working with the child and the family is going to be a really great way to do this. So now, sometimes, despite our best efforts, we may make a mistake. And a child may eat a food that they're allergic to. And that's why we have our second pillar, the pillar of emergency preparedness. We're going to want to be prepared to react. Prepared to recognize anaphylaxis, give epinephrine, and activate emergency response. So we talked generally about recognizing anaphylaxis, and now we all know that reactions can be different from one person to the next. Reactions can be different from the same person one time and the same person another time. To make some of this way easier is this emergency care plan. I talked about this when I was talking about the importance of communication. This is ultimately something that any caregiver who's taking care of the child should have available. So if and when there's a breakdown in the first pillar and there is a need for epinephrine, then the child can be appropriately treated. Now, as far as us parents, by the time we've gone through this and trained enough people, we ourselves could probably do this blind without this. And we've memorized it, and we know what we're going to do. But it's really super important when there's somebody who's a little bit less familiar, who isn't with our kids all that much, to be able to have this thing that they can go through that's going to clearly tell them, if this, then this. So those emergency care plans are going to be really important. Most allergists will give you one. If you don't have one, ask your allergist for one. A great example of one is from the American Academy of Pediatrics. This was put together to be a pretty universal thing that allergists, pediatricians, and school nurses would all get behind. And this is a nice thing because you don't want to necessarily have three different versions of the same care plan. And so. I'll go into some details with this. Now, this particular emergency care plan has one section where if you have any of these symptoms, then you go ahead and you give the epinephrine. And then another section, which is if you only have mild symptoms that don't count as anaphylaxis, then you don't need to give epinephrine, but you do need to do certain things. So. This first box that I'm talking about, which is the do not pass go, just give epinephrine. One thing that is important to think about here is a trigger. If your child eats a food and now you're suspecting 
this might be their allergen or this might be a food they might be allergic to. Now, that's gonna get us thinking that, okay, if we now have any one of these symptoms, then we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna give epinephrine. So shortness of breath, wheezing, coughing, or paleness, blue skin, or in this case, it's hard to tell for parents, but for healthcare providers, um, very fast heartbeat can happen in little ones especially, and then low blood pressure also. Fainting, dizziness, <clears throat> tightness of the throat, hoarseness of the voice, hoarse cry, trouble breathing or swallowing, little ones can drool. Swelling, significant swelling of the lips or tongue that can get in the way of breathing. Significant vomiting or diarrhea. Hives all over the body. That feeling of doom, confusion that I mentioned before, altered consciousness or profound agitation. These would all be things in the setting of having that exposure to a likely allergen that would make somebody want to give epinephrine. And so that is according to the American Academy of Pediatrics action plan. Now again, go through this with your healthcare provider. Make sure that you have an understanding. Everybody has things a little different, but the basic concept is that epinephrine is the treatment for anaphylaxis. Now, for mild symptoms, if you have more than one mild system for different systems, then that would be a reason to consider epinephrine. So for example, if somebody only had a few hives in the area where the food touched and they look awesome, they're doing great, they're playful, then that's somebody that observing and now following the next instructions on this sheet would be what they would do. Some people might put in there an antihistamine would be appropriate, some allergists wouldn't. This again is gonna be something very personal with the allergist and with the family. And as long as people understand that antihistamines are not the treatment for anaphylaxis, they're comfort medicine, and they can be adjunct, they could be in addition, but never to be replaced and never to slow down when anaphor, when epinephrine would be given, that'll be a, a conversation that the healthcare team needs to have with the families. But if someone has a bunch of mild symptoms, then it's different. So one way that some people will think about it is two systems. So if you have some sneezing, itchy mouth, itchy nose, and now the kid has belly ache, and they had their allergen, then many would say go ahead and treat with epinephrine. Hives plus other systems, many would say go ahead and treat with epinephrine. And so this is the way to think about it and when you're communicating to other people who are caring for your kids, you'll want them to have those action plans. Whatever you guys ultimately work through with your pediatricians and your allergists and memorize them and understand them and have the person who's caring for your kid also understand it. Now, I have this on here because for me, one of the most useful things for me to try to get a sense of how a kid is doing is by playing with them. So if your child is having an allergic reaction and you're freaking out, don't let them know you're freaking out. Keep it inside and be the most fun person you could possibly be while you're trying to engage them. Now, if they won't smile with Elmo, if they can't do the thing that they always want to do, now you know they're feeling sick and that's going to change your level of care and that's going to change what you may do. So that kid who possibly eat something, they're on the playground, they continue to be happy and smile and they just have a few hives around their mouth, then following that action plan and then watching and being ready and following the recommendations of the doctor is going to be something that would make a ton of sense. The same kid who eats the same muffin, has the rash around their mouth and now they are out of their mind and they are crying and they're irritable and they're just acting bizarre, that would be a kid who considering using epinephrine would be something that you'd want to do. Um, things to keep in mind again are kids are kids, especially the young ones. Kids get hangry, kids get pissed, kids have temper tantrums. But that's where the trigger is gonna be really important. If 
your kid was happy, bang their head on the slide and now they're crying like crazy. Well, maybe they bang their head. Um, your kid was happy, they ate that muffin, and now they have the hives and now they're out of their mind. Well, then that could be an allergic reaction, that could be anaphylaxis, and following your action plan is gonna be important. Kids say weird things. My kid said he couldn't get the taste out. This is gonna be something to remember and remind other people who are caring for our kids that you know a frog in the throat, an elephant on the chest, all these things might be a way a four or five year old might communicate. And so this will be something for people to be aware of. Keep in mind that the longer an allergic reaction goes untreated, the harder it is to clean up, just like border damage. We'll want to shut it down early. Epinephrine shuts it down early. It's first line treatment for anaphylaxis. Delays are associated with an increase in mortality. But one thing we don't talk about much is, is that giving it makes you feel better when you feel crummy. So when you're feeling terrible and you're having an allergic reaction, you're having a hard time breathing and you're itchy and you're vomiting, epinephrine is going to make you feel better quick. So that's one thing that we want to think about and potentially communicate. Now there's several forms of um, auto injectors now to allow us to be able to give it effectively in the community setting. Um, and so getting to know which one is yours and getting your hands on trainers and getting comfortable with training other people with how to use it is going to be very important. And for all of these, each of the companies has um, on their websites training information and training videos. And we all hope that all healthcare providers who prescribe them are doing training as well. So if you don't feel comfortable how to use it, then get trained. Common side effects are actually kind of, it's doing what we want it to do. We can get pale, um, we can get shaky, we have receptors on our skeletal muscle for epinephrine, so we shake. And I like to describe that as a good thing because we know it's working. And so if you know what's coming, then it's not as scary. And so it's a side effect that's expected. Um, some people can feel anxious. Um, if many people who are actually having anaphylaxis already have a very fast heartbeat from the reaction itself, and this actually can slow it. But in somebody who didn't need it, if they had it, it can make their heart beat a little faster. Some people can have headache and some people can feel nauseous. But all of these side effects are really because the medicine's doing what we want it to. 10 to 20% of people might need a second dose. Having two available is gonna be important, so you don't wanna split your doses. Also, sometimes the first one may not work, or we might put it in our hand when we wanna put it in our kid, so having the second one's gonna be important. Watch out for pockets, buttons, and seams. These things are designed to go through one layer of thin clothing. In the little babies, it's easy enough to drop their pants because you can see their thigh, what you're going for, but you don't wanna take somebody who's in a public place and feel the need to go into a private place, you're not gonna necessarily wanna move them. You'll wanna be able to do it right then and there. So we would never want an adolescent to feel like they need to go to the bathroom to drop their pants. So staying where you are and treating there through the pants would be totally appropriate. We wanna be prepared for a fearful child. Not everybody's gonna let you give them a little shot in their leg. Um, and so sometimes they bolt. And when they're little, we want to watch out for those hands because they may also sit very calmly on us as we go to give the auto injector. And then when that little short skinny needle goes in their leg, they might feel the pinch and grab. And that's when they can cause a, a laceration. So I'm going to teach you when we're done with this part, I'm going to do a hands on how to hold a baby and how to think about holding a kid also to keep those hands from getting in the way. Again, you'll want to get your trainers. So the AVQ and the epinephrine from Mindland and from EpiPen, these come with trainers with a prescription. But if you have generic epinephrine from Impax, those don't routinely come with a trainer, but the company will give you a trainer. So you'll want to call the Impax company and ask them for a trainer. Um, what we're doing in our office here at MGH is we're called, we've already called the company and we get hundreds at a time and then we distribute them to the families because you need to train your babysitters and your schools so having a trainer is really important because 
although this is becoming way more utilized, um, not everybody's been trained on it, and there's an extra step to it. So storing epi, you're not going to want to store it in the glove box of your car because extreme heat can decrease its efficacy. Um, you're also not going to want to store it in a place where it's frozen because the mechanism might not work. So we'll want to keep it at close to room temperature. If you're out skiing, then keep it on the inside of your coat, not on the outside. If you're out at the beach, don't leave it on your cowl baking in the sun. Go to shade, bring it with you. Try to keep it close to room temperature. Now, we're going to want to dispel some of the myths, and I already got a little bit of them, but it is a myth and a dangerous one at that to think that giving antihistamine first is the way to go. So like I said, antihistamines are comfort medicine only. We have lots of receptors on the skin and mucosal surfaces for antihistamine, or for histamine, and the antihistamines will be very good at that comfort, but that's about all it's good for. Um, and so it doesn't take care of the lungs, it doesn't take care of the heart, it doesn't take care of the gut. That's where epinephrine works very quickly. Epinephrine goes to peak levels in eight minutes. It takes antihistamines 30 to 60 minutes to kick in. And again, they're comfort only. And so the NIAID guidelines actually say that one of the major reasons why someone might think about delaying giving epinephrine and therefore increasing the chance of a life-threatening reaction is because they thought that antihistamines would work. So you don't want that to change your behavior. Giving epinephrine and then giving antihistamine afterwards while waiting for an ambulance is appropriate and that's going to be worked through with an allergist. Some people may prescribe, some people may not. Um, uh, but always knowing that epinephrine is the treatment of choice for anaphylaxis is important. It is a myth that the reason we're calling an ambulance is because you gave epi. So this is something, get this out of your mind and get this out of the minds of any of the babysitters who take care of your kids, which is that when you give epi, the reason you call an ambulance is because it was bad enough to give epi in the first place, and that's why we're calling the ambulance. The ambulance is going to bring things that make epinephrine work better. It brings oxygen, it brings IV fluid, it brings people, we want those people there. Now, some people would say, look, I didn't want to give the epi because I didn't want to call an ambulance. It would be better to then give the epi and convince yourself to call the ambulance while the kid is now treated. The earlier you give it, the less likely you need what the ambulance is going to bring. So this is a concept that I like to pass along. Yes, it's very important to call an ambulance, um, but you don't want to mess up twice. So the calling of the ambulance is also really important. And this really happens, is that somebody may treat their kid, throw them in the car seat, start driving to the emergency department because they look pretty good. Then all of a sudden in the car seat, the kid starts to wheeze and cough and barf. And now the person's driving 85 miles an hour to the emergency department. That's bad. So hang out where you have control. Be in the confines of your living room or the restaurant or wherever you are so you can focus on your child and you can figure out, okay, I gave the epi, 911 is on the way, do I give the second epi? These will be things that then you'll be able to pay attention to instead of driving like a bat out of hell. It's also a myth that the needle is huge. It's actually really short. The needle is shorter than the width of a dime. Uh, in the case of the 0.3 doses, it is three quarters of an inch. In the case of the 0.15 doses, it's half of an inch. In the case of the 0.1 dose, it's shorter than that. This is really reassuring. If you ask a five-year-old, how long do you think, how long do you think the needle is? Oftentimes, they'll say the length of the device, and that's terrifying. I'd run away and cry, um, <laughs> but it's really super short. But they wouldn't know it unless you teach them. And so these will be things that now you guys can have these conversations to take away the fear. So just to drive it home, epinephrine is first line treatment of choice. It acts where we need it to. It'll make you feel better. It's fast acting. It's safe. Delays can increase the risk of a fatal reaction. Um, if in doubt, go ahead and give it. And now those are the pillars. Now we need to take the pillars wherever we go. And so we'll want to think about how and where we do what strategies. It's going to, 
again, drive home how important it is to communicate with people, to teach, and to be thinking ahead and planning. So I'm going to go through the demo of how to give it, and I'm also going to show you how real ones work. Um, and uh, let me start by any, let's start by you guys collecting some of the questions here. So this is the Myelan generic epinephrine. It comes in a plastic carrying case. Teach trainers to take it out or caregivers. I've seen people try to give it while it's still in this. Okay, you hold it in the hand that you write with. I'm a righty, so it goes in my right hand. Blue to the sky, orange to the thigh. Pressure on the orange tip when the safety is taken out is going to release a short skinny needle. Can the camera see it? All right. And here it goes. All right. So this thing is super short and skinny. I don't know if. You can barely see it. Now this is so skinny that if you hit it on the seam of your jeans, it's gonna bend back and it might not get into the kit. But now on this one, notice this orange thing. This is a needle retractor. So as soon as I release pressure, then this thing's gonna go and hide the needle. Now this is a three second hold on the kid's thigh. But then I did that and the needle retractor came up. This is the AVQ. Um, now, the AVQ is available in 0 0.1, in 0 0.15, and 0 0.3. Now, in these, you take off the case. Now, this was, this happens to be a super old one from several years ago from my house. Um, this would say, take off the sheath. Take off some, here we go. So now the hold time has dropped to two. And here we go. Now this one comes out for 0 0.3 seconds and then self retracts. Making the chance of a laceration a little less because that needle isn't in the thigh of the child. In all of these cases, then you're going to go by ambulance to the hospital where you should be observed for four to six hours at least. Um, part of that is that sometimes kids can have a second base. And being in the hospital is a good place to be for that second phase because sometimes it can be harder to treat than the first. I don't want to scare or frighten people with this <laughs> scary baby dolls, but <laughs> <laughs> this is a good way to show some holding strategies that can work well. All right. And the third device. I'm just going to do this before I actually help baby over there. This is the generic epinephrine. It comes out of the holder. It has a needle end that you take off the protector. The safety, you take that off. And then pressure on this red tip, and you hold for 10 seconds. Now, as far as the holding goes, in the Little kids, we don't want those hands to come up, and we can sit them on. I'm a righty, so I'm going to sit them on my left thigh. I'm going to have my arms come across, so I tuck their arms behind mine, and now the best they can do is T-Rex. And now I can take off the safety, squeeze up the thigh, and give my three-second hold in this case. One, two, three. And then I would use these same types with each of the auto injectors with this potential hold. And then the other hold that we can do in a bigger kit 
or if we're alone and we're having a hard time holding our baby. Is we can lay the child down and put our hands, well, if this guy could bend his arms, they'd be behind me. So this way now I have the thigh right here and then I can take off the safety and give my dose. One, two, three. And the best he could do is punch me in the back of the head. Can't grab the auto injector. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yes. Um, what do you do with the EpiPens when they expire? You know, is there like an easy way to dispose of them and bring them somewhere? Well, um, many healthcare providers, providers will take them. I personally love them because I do what you just saw. Um, I would not try to do that myself. Using your own trainers to train, um, some people put off the auto injectors in their hands accidentally. So giving them to a healthcare provider to dispose of it is what I recommend. Yes. Do some allergies change over the course of time, and specifically, do they get better? So, in the case of milk and egg, most kids, they say about 80% of kids with a milk or egg allergy will outgrow it. Um, now, peanuts and tree nuts, different, it's flip-flop. About 80%, a little more, might uh, uh, keep it in peanuts and about 90% of tree nuts will keep it. Fish and shellfish is generally kept also. Um, wheat and soy are generally somewhere outgrown as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. How often should you get your care plan updated? Something I just noticed, I have two little ones with peanut allergies and I had a care plan in uh, June of 2018. Yep. And I recently got an update in January of this year and already the care plan had the dosage has already changed. So whenever your child increases in weight, needing a new dose of the auto injector, you should then change the emergency care plan to equal that. Whenever there is a allergy you either added or taken away because now they passed a challenge, that'll be something to update. And then whenever the school also needs a refresh, most of the time annually, if no changes, would be something that should be reasonable. Great. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have a number of questions from through Facebook Live and from the audience. Do you know if watercolor paint has milk or not? I don't. Um, and so they don't necessarily need to have clear labeling like food does. They're not regulated by the FDA. But in any case, Calling a company and asking would be something that you'd want to do if you're suspicious of it. Would love to know what you suggest for retesting several years after diagnosis, identifying allergens. Touching base with your allergist is always going to be worth it. Um, some people say annually. Uh, if not for retesting the actual aller allergy, because some people they seem to have their allergy and likely keeping it is what they're gonna do, at least touching base with the allergy team to go over management strategies, make sure that action plans are updated, make sure that the auto injectors are updated. And also, nowadays, things are moving fast with recommendations and different things that are on the horizon. And so having these conversations with a healthcare provider at least annually would be nice if, uh, if there's access for it. And then especially when there's big changes in life. So going into kindergarten, going into the school where the policy might be different than it was for the last several years, going to college, um, going on a big trip, these will all be things to think about as far as food allergy management and things like that. Should we throw away expired auto injectors? So we just kind of mentioned that. I'd say um, giving them to healthcare teams to dispose of them in Sharps container or contacting your local public health to see how to dispose of Sharps. But I might, please don't everybody come to me, but I, I like 
<laughs> using auto injectors. But I can imagine that like the 400 people from Facebook all like mailing them. So, but, uh, but, but your allergists may also get jazzed up about shooting them off in the air. So that might be something to use. Is there a specific training program you recommend for schools? Well, so in full disclosure, um, I um, am co-founder and content creator for Allergy Home, and then we have um, free training for schools. And so um, uh, going to the Allergy Home site and checking that out uh, would be reasonable. What's the recommendation for teens with food allergies and kissing? So as I mentioned before about the saliva, um, so communication is awesome, uh, but this is a funny thing because this is a funny topic to talk about with teens. And so kissing itself is a funny thing to talk about with some teens. And then to add into it this element of um, food allergy is going to add to a challenge because um, talking to my teen about kissing in itself seems totally absurd. Um, and, but talking about food allergies to him is very easy. And so everybody's going to have their own thing with their own teen. And learning how to have this conversation while getting across these basics that I already laid out, which are the basics that waiting several hours and then an allergy-free meal um, is what the study showed. It's probably really cool if right when you guys are going to have open mouth kissing, you know that they didn't eat it for a while and maybe a day, and maybe your partner is going to not eat the allergen because it's going to be able to decrease um, potential cross reactions and and other exposures and so this way um, the person can feel like they can have their guard down rather than constantly making sure that they don't accidentally put their hands in their mouth or what have you so again that partnership and talking um, through it and understanding is going to be great and if somebody's partner doesn't care and doesn't want to help out then you know that's probably not a relationship worth open mouth kissing <laughs> My daughter had an anaphylactic reaction to a tree nut, and the EpiPen injection we gave was not effective. How soon can you give a second injection? So, on those action plans, um, which are based on anaphylaxis practice parameters, the practice parameters actually say that someone can give another dose 5 to 15 minutes after the first or liberalized as necessary. So, it pretty much says that you can give that second dose as soon as you need to. And so this would be a conversation to have with an allergist, to know what are you looking for once you gave the first one. How do you know it's working and how do you know it's not? Um, and so, it, things that you'll be looking for are going to be improvement in those respiratory symptoms, um, it, being able to more calmly breathe, move air, um, if someone is um, starting to get more aware and alert and they are also um, starting to feel better, those are going to be signs that it's working. If nothing is happening and they are looking terrible and you're waiting for the ambulance, then giving more epinephrine will be the way to go. But having this conversation with your allergist will be extremely important in following your action plan. Why does a second injector require 10 seconds versus 3 seconds? So the different auto injector companies have different timings based on what they submitted to the FDA and so and what they have in their in their PDR and their in their drug recommendations um, and so uh, they each ask for a different hold time and the first the the company that I showed with the blue. I'm having a word, word finding problem with safety, uh, or not safety, but yeah, safety, the, with the blue safety and the orange tip, they happen to ask for a drop in the whole time to three seconds. Um, and the, um, the generic epinephrine one, the one that has the 10 second hold time, they did not change the hold time. Now the challenge sometimes there is if you have a wriggly, scriggly kid, then we're going to want to keep them held nice and firm, um, and so that's where it can be a little challenging. And so you saw how fast that, that epinephrine came out of the auto injectors that I shot off. 
So that's one thing also to keep in mind is that the medicine leaves the device pretty quickly. Any specific tips on how to explain to a very young child about two years old about her allergy? Well, so this is a really great point. And I won't focus only on a two-year-old, but kind of go along the gamut, which is know your kid's developmental expectations. So in the very young ones, we're not gonna want them to pick up food off the floor and eat it. We're gonna want them to check in with mom or dad or grandma or a grown up before they eat something. They should eat the things that are meant for them. Um, they, um, and, and again, two is very young and it's gonna be challenging. Um, and as they get older, it gets easier and easier for them to understand some of these rules. And then all of a sudden it's the no sharing, um, wash your hands before you eat food, or try, right? Or, uh, or definitely wash your hands before you eat food. But one of the things we don't wanna get in is creating kids who are really obsessive about it. And so if a kid who happens to touch their face and be a kid feels like they have to wash their hands every five minutes, that's gonna be a challenge. And so this brings me up to um, uh, sometimes things can get a little bit challenging and scary for some families. And when you feel like it's getting in your ability to deal well and it is compromising quality of life, then getting um, extra support from um, a child psychologist is going to be something you want to think of. So if any of these healthy practices turn into something that starts feeling unhealthy, then um, getting some support to help the kids cope with that is going to be really important. So I think we only have time for one more question. Can I, before, before we go, I just wanted to thank um, AFA New England with David Gideon for coming. Um, and uh, I'm pleased everybody here who's local touch base with uh, the resource here, AFA New England, and they've been like really supportive of our community, helping with advocacy efforts and educational initiatives. Thank you. So after this program, if you don't mind, um, I mean, we're welcome to open up the room for anyone else who has questions for Dr. Pistoner, you're welcome to ask them. And if you don't mind working with us on answering any pending questions we have through Facebook Live, that would be great. Great, and then on, um, on if you have any, um, so we actually have a survey for those who joined us on Facebook Live. It's on the Food Allergy Center MGH Facebook page. Please fill it out so we know how to make this better. And then also on there, if anybody is interested in advocacy efforts um, and or educational efforts or wants to learn more about how you can help, then you can also uh, uh, put a comment on the, uh, the Food Allergy Center um, MGH Facebook page and uh, might take us a while, but we'll get back to you. So one final question. Why has peanuts become a massive food allergy? When we were kids, everyone ate with no issues. And so rise in food allergies is something that seems to be multifactorial. There seems to be a lot of things involved. Um, one of the things that may have happened was that as recommendations back in early 2000 to delay the introduction of highly allergenic food, that earlier oral exposure may actually be protective and studies are starting to show that, specific to peanut, that one study that now guidelines have been based on and that have changed our standard of care, now are recommending that in kids who are at high risk of developing a peanut allergy, that they have screening but also have introduction as early as four to six months of life, which is so different than what it used to be. So it does seem that the earlier introductions of the foods seems to be um, a way that now we can decrease some of this increase. Um, there's also many things that have been associated with the rise in allergies in general, including potentially vitamin D deficiency, change in our microbiome, change in the good bacteria that live in and, and on us. Um, and uh, many others. Great, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kistner. All right, thanks for having me.